Hey guys, welcome to the Black Forge YouTube channel. We today have Elevalon. I believe I said that correctly. He's also, yeah. um, he's also the the designer and creator behind Bone Weaver. But today we're really going to focus more on Elevalon. But we'll talk all things music today. And so Tristan, I believe your last name is it is it Fela? Perfect on both accounts, you know. Cool. Usually people have a lot of trouble both with the last name and with Elevalon. So good job. Well done. Awesome. Awesome. Now you're in Madison, Wisconsin. Is that right? Uh, you know, when I released the Bone Weaver album, I was in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, but I actually grew up in the Detroit area. And uh, since recording that, I moved back to the Detroit area. So currently in uh, Metro Detroit. Yep. Cool. Very cool. So a lot of people are obviously not going to be familiar with a lot of the artists that I talk to this is very much that kind of a situation because you do a style of music that I would say is very obscure and that's not a criticism whatsoever it's a it's it's honestly it's more of a compliment your music a lot of people would label dungeon synth or ambient or whatever you want to label it I I found you uh, was listening to your music and was just like, wow, this guy is really gifted. It's kind of a blend to me. It's kind of a blend of classical guitar meets medieval times meets. Um, I know this is terrible, but the Renaissance Festival, if you've ever been to the Renaissance Festival, I felt like, man, this is great. Awesome music. I feel like you hit the nail on the head just with that. Um, you know, I've been a musician since I was very young and uh, was always more into, uh, you know, music that emphasizes, I guess, nuanced instrumentation. Um, and so, you know, as I got older, I would dig deeper and deeper into things that I found really had like a level of complexity or, um, you know, whether it's multiple melodies going on at the same time or, you know, unique harmonies or uh, dynamic grooves, you know, interplay between melodic and rhythmic instruments, whatever it is. Um, that's sort of what I've always been drawn to. But on top of that, ever since I was a kid, I've also just been very steeped in the fantasy genre and uh, specifically, you know, medieval fantasy. Just love it. I grew up on, you know, old fantasy video games and books and Lord of the Rings came out right when I was, uh, you know, in very formative years. Those movies uh, really made an impact on me and, you know, many others too. So uh, I just really, the music I make is just, I, I'm very, um, driven by aesthetic i guess and so yeah. i try to pull in the aesthetics of things i like and the sounds of things i like and so no matter what i do it always seems to come out sounding a little bit medieval and uh certainly a little bit fantasy and you know i try to really make the instrumentation interesting and nuanced to a level that i enjoy listening to it so that's awesome have you ever been to a renaissance festival uh, you know, interestingly enough, I haven't. Um, oh, I've been, I've had near misses maybe five, six times. Um, but my girlfriend and I have been trying to plan one for, you know, a couple of years now getting out to one. Um, yeah. And yeah, it just keeps happening that I, I can't go. So um, I will go. It's it's going to happen. And I was thinking setting up a booth and, you know, peddling some Elevalon merchandise would probably be a, a big hit there. It would. Um, I do a lot of Renaissance festival adjacent activities okay. uh, or hobbies in my life. And, um, you know, I've pulled Dungeon Synth into those and it's always been a, a smashing hit, right? It's been a just very successful. So I figured the Ren Fair, there's like a basically a 100% overlap, I, I would think, with uh, potential listeners and, you know, uh, people who are fans of that. I don't even know what to call it. Activity? Hobby, I guess. I don't it, know. It's a fire. it's a culture unto itself. Like when we go to the Renaissance Festival, we go every year. It comes to Charlotte, where I am, and we go. We make it an intentional, like a plan. My my sister is very interested in fantasy. She's a Lord of the Rings addict. I mean, she has Lord of the Rings collectible mem memorabilia everywhere. <laughs> my wife and I love the same kind of things, just not to the same 
unhealthy degree that my sister does. <laughs> and we go to the Renaissance Festival every year. And it's just one of the coolest things because there are, there are live musicians, there's performers, there's all these different things. And there's one, uh, I think her name's Sarah Marie McMillan or McMillan Harp, Harpist. And she's just incredible. And she just, she plays all these classical and Celtic songs um, throughout. So you can sit and listen to her and buy an album at the end. And it's just so cool. I love that. Yeah, definitely sounds like something I need to get to. Um, yeah, especially because, you know, the I guess the folk element to it as well, like your Celtic music. And I just, I guess just folk music from any culture from across the world, something I totally list sort of uh, cosplay, not cosplay, but like role playing where, you know, people are acting like they're from this time period. It just sounds perfect. So really need to go and uh, it's going to happen. It's great. It is so great. Well, let's jump into your music for a minute because I want to ask you some questions about your most recent work. Of course, you've only been doing Elevelon. I'm going to probably say that wrong at some point in this interview. Good so far. I'm trying. You've gotten three albums so far. Your first one was now this one I may get wrong. Nimua's gift. Uh I, I say it as Nimue. So Nimue's, Nimue's gift. Yep. And Nimue is just uh the Lady of the Lake from like Arthurian yeah. legend and lore. So that was in 2021. So you've only been doing this for two years, is that right? Uh I guess so. I started I want to say in early 2020, uh, essentially, I released the first Bone Weaver project, and it was like, ah, oh, wow, that was seven years of hard work. Um, let's think about the next record. For the next record, I want more synths, and I want better atmospheres. I think at the time, I was listening to a lot of Alcest, and I want to say... Um, that was a while back, but I remember thinking like all ses just all the, the really cool soundscapes that they have built into a lot of their songs. I was like, I need to be able to pull something off like that. If I want to do that, I need more synths. And then when I, you know, I picked up like just a cheap MIDI controller and started messing around with it as a COVID hobby project and um, realized that within, you know, a couple weeks of doing this, I was like, I'm just making dungeon synth. And, you know, I love dungeon synth. So let's, mm -hmm let's make this a thing. And then I thought about, okay, well, I've got some keyboard skills and what artists do I like best? Well, I don't know. Let's see if we can maybe zoom into the fantasy synth sort of side of the whole, I know, cause there's like the dark dungeon music and there's the more raw old school uh, black metal inspired dungeon synth and love that stuff. But you know, where I'm coming from is just like a huge fantasy nerd. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I had been reading Robin Hood at the time, right? So very like uplifting, heroic, courageous, uh, stuff like that. So it sort of just fell into place where, you know, I have a lot of harpsichords and uh, brass and really the heroic sort of atmosphere kind of came together unexpectedly. Yeah. So oh, it's amazing. Stuff. When I was listening to you, I was, because I'll be truthful, I hadn't heard of you before and I was listening to your music and was like blown away because I really love this kind of music. And I, there are so many independent artists out there doing their own work. And so it's, you'll stumble upon some, you'll listen to them. They're okay. They're not great. They're, you kind of forget about them, but then there are a few that will stand out and you definitely stood out. That's why I sent you a message. I was like, I got to talk to this guy. I want to find out about who he is and what his music's about, because you do have a level of complexity to it. It's not, it's not just simple, um, simple melodies you're playing it's very classical in 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 essence it has the classical guitar i believe you use quite frequently am i incorrect on that one uh so everything i record in elevalon itself is um like i i use midi instruments pretty specifically just because uh i think for that sort of like late 90s early 2000s uh i don't know there's like a certain like look, not quite lo-fi but that sort of computery aesthetic to it I, I really like and I think that shines through most obviously on Nimue's gift but um so for all of the Elevalon stuff I record it on keyboard but okay. generally I write it on the guitar or if there's a good like uh you know if there's a, an intricate lute part 
in on the album i'll i'll write it on the guitar first generally all the good stuff i write comes from the guitar first not all of it but oftentimes and when i listen back i can think oh yeah like i played that on the piano or oh no that was a guitar part like i can you know kind of piece it together just from hearing it um but having the multiple approaches i think lends a you know a different style to the types of um melodies and harmonies that i write in those parts and so it I don't know. I think it's it's nice to have a multifaceted approach to it. Yeah. Now, did you are you a trained musician or did you train yourself? Did you go to school for it? Yeah. So my mother's a piano teacher. She's a fantastic pianist. Uh, she, you know, has been teaching piano her whole life, and um, you know, and plays at a very high level. Uh, so I started playing piano when I was four, maybe five years old, and I took to it very quickly. Uh, really enjoyed it, and then when I was maybe nine or 10, I really started falling in love with like Black Sabbath and, uh, you know, Ronnie James Dio and all, all the stuff my dad was getting me into at the right yeah. young age, nine or 10, Iron Maiden, stuff like that. Um, and so, of course, <clears throat> I asked my parents, okay, I got to start playing the drums. And they're like, okay, you're not getting a drum set. That's absurd. That's too loud. But, you know, we'll see. And so I ended up getting a guitar from a friend, probably 10 years old and started playing it then. So from there, you know, guitar lessons up through, I don't know, maybe until I was 18. Um, starting with, you know, pretty standard, just American, like blues rock guitar uh, lessons, but eventually took like finger style jazz um, lessons as well from a, a classical teacher. Um, and, you know, I would learn, like, I, I got more into the the classical side of things and taught myself some like Bach pieces and uh, various other like Paco Bell's Canon and just, you know, a few like classical pops hits to, uh, you know, bust out on the, on the guitar. One artist I really fell in love with that hugely influenced my guitar playing style as well as, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Opeth, but you know, of course they're yeah. on your wall. Yeah. Oh, they are. Yeah. That's the, uh, I saw them in Red Rocks when they did the, uh, the Garden of the Titans live DVD. And so I had to snag the poster, of course. But yeah, Love Opeth, all of the, I mean, like Still Life or Blackwater Park, all of the just crazy, intricate finger style uh, that Mike Ockerfeld does is just always blew me away. And so, of course, I had to learn like 20 of those uh, little arrangements. So that also, whether you know, conscious and intentional or not has been a big influence on the style that I have with Element One, I think. Well, let's jump into that because I think this is one of the most interesting things. A lot of people misunderstand the genre of black metal, which I know you're not black metal, but a lot of people misunderstand that genre. But I find it what what I like about black metal a lot is how it's really just a canvas for so many other things. You have atmospheric black metal, you've got black gaze and strangely enough it's associated as dungeon synth and even though it's not really metal whatsoever right. and i think that's people misunderstand it. it's a misconception i think one of the most appealing things about black metal is the very thing that you do the mystical mythical fantasy world um, there's a an album that came out this past year and i, I can't remember what it was titled but um, fathomage is a guy in um, australia he does a dungeon synth project, but Fathomage is his black metal project, but it's atmospheric black metal. We're not talking raw black metal. And it's just so driven. He's a huge Lord of the Rings fanatic. And so he everything has a center around a fantasy element. And I think a lot of people who like black metal and who are, are interested in black metal find themselves liking dungeon synth or or its variants because of the same elements that drew us into black metal. Do you think that's the case? I completely agree. Um, when it comes to music, I'd say I'm very picky um, and especially so with black metal for some reason. But uh, mm -hmm. like you're saying, I think you're really hitting, hitting home that black metal oftentimes is very, um, it's, it's a subset of metal that's very escapist, I guess. And it's, uh, intentions oftentimes and so that escapism will often allow people to bring in elements from you know other areas of whether it's music or just their life you know other aesthetics and imbue them into black metal and those are always my favorite projects you know when i listen to something like 
Batushka, right? It's not like cut and dry black metal, right? But, uh, you know, that first record that they put out, I had never heard anything like it, right? But they're, you know, incorporating orthodox chanting with black metal. I mean, I'm just, yeah. they're it's taking different. two different worlds and, you know, pulling them together. And I, I really like um, the tendency of black metal artists to do that. And my favorite ones are generally the ones that just pull in these totally wild concepts that you would never think of working with black metal, but, and yet here we are, they work perfectly. Um, I don't know if you're a fan of the Hungarian artist, Thy Catafalque, but um, he's on- I won't Nips. lie to you, so. Sorry, what was that? I don't even know them, so I won't lie to I, you. Yeah, that I do. Um, I, one of my favorite current, currently active metal projects, just of all, um, he's mixing black metal with Hungarian folk music and crazy synthesizer like breakdowns. It turns into like almost like new wave, uh, like synth pop at times, where like mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> a lady is singing in Hungarian over these crazy like synth breakdowns, and but then it's black metal two seconds later with the most seamless transition you've ever heard. Yeah. Like, you know, I you would never expect. I mean, if you told me that that would be my favorite artist in 2023, I would like, mm -hmm. you know, two years ago, if you well, I've been listening to him for probably eight years, so. If I hadn't known about them and you told me that, I would say you're crazy, right? There's no way that would work, but works perfectly. So, and that's and what like. text me this guy. Uh, okay, when we're done. I want to. I want to make sure I'm on the same page. But that sounds awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I'll send it to you. We can uh, discuss. Yeah. Have you heard Abstract Void? I have not. You know, I should actually write down a little list here. <laughs> the being a, um, I'm also a huge fan of '80s synth wave and new wave oh. and anything from like even dark wave that's now like new bands that are around it. and i found abstract void randomly i don't even know how and it's basically a blend of synth wave and black metal so i i call it black wave just for kicks just to be fun i don't even think that's a real subgenre but but it could be it could be might, might as well yeah abstract, abstract void. void really weird and good and, and I think what you said hits it on the mark because I, I have noticed that almost every other kind of music has limitations on what you can do. One of the beautiful things about black metal and the various subgenres, which is what Black Forge is about. I do not just want to cover black metal. In fact, I'm not even a huge raw black metal fan. My, my goal with creating Black Forge was to elevate artists like yourself who aren't going to have millions of followers you don't even have 20,000 or 50,000 followers per se but you have incredible music and it's music that doesn't fall under a an easy to fit description and black metal is just that it has so many subgenres. I think that black metal is one of the few places that artists are still free to do whatever the heck they want they can create how they want they don't have to worry about I, I've listened to so many. Mir Kerr is one of the ones that I absolutely love. I, I love Amelie Broon. She is incredible. And the way she's been able to do some albums that had black metal influence, and then she's gone off and done Nordic folk, completely just folk. She she has the freedom to do that, and nobody can tell her otherwise. She just does what she wants. Yeah, she is a really standout artist in the genre, I think. Um I was amazed by her because generally when I find a new artist, if they're doing something totally different that hits home, like I'll have a moment of like, wow, I was not ready for that. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Usually it happen like once with an artist because, you know, they're doing one thing that's totally different and you're like, that just really hit home. But it happened twice for me with her because when I first heard her, it was like, oh, wow, her voice with these folk instruments is just heavenly. And then, you know, five minutes later, oh, wow, her voice with these black metal instruments is just demonic. And, uh, you know, it's like this Banshee's whale is so powerful. So, yeah, amazing artist. Uh, really enjoy she that. She plays a million different instruments. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't just play one instrument. That's she, I've seen some of her posts where she'll share about her childhood and, and all the different instruments she grew up playing. So that's, again, it's like you're not finding somebody who just sings over auto-tune and... <laughs> 
and they don't really know anything about music other than just vocals. This, these are people who really love the craft of it. Right. And to some extent, it it's kind of refreshing to me that, you know, you're saying like you're trying to highlight artists that, you know, don't have 20,000 or 50,000 followers per se. Um, it's kind of refreshing to me that so many of these people congregate in a scene that doesn't have these crazy, uh, you know, there isn't like a huge economic incentive to, uh, you know, make this music. There can be if you do really well and it blows up, you know, you can certainly um, make a, a living off it. But I just think that you get much more genuine expressions of, you know, human emotion and creativity when there isn't someone dangling a dollar in front of you the whole time, you know, because I, I find that is one thing that irks me about, you know, I, I definitely have interacted with a number of people who are trying to make say pop hits or like, you know, trying to get on the radio. And it's very much like what you said, where they're like, well, I would like to do this because I love say like, I love Brahms. Right. And so mm -hmm. I would like to incorporate maybe some classical music into my song here, you know, maybe throw in like some, you know, whatever it is, harpsichord or, you know, whatever, but you know, people are, I guess, they, they don't want to do it because they know they need to fit into a certain mold to hit the radio, at least in, you know, the American top 40, for example. So it's yeah. a less genuine expression of musical output, right? I, I think music is really a manner of expressing emotion, right? You're trying to get someone to feel something with music you write. And personally, I want that to be as genuine as possible because if you really listen to a truly genuine song, I feel like it helps to get you to know the person whose music you're listening to. Okay. And, yeah. you know, if it's a facade, if it's not really you, why are you, why are you writing it? Well, it's for monetary gain perhaps. And I don't know. It's a beautiful thing about definitely these obscure subgenres of metal and synth music. Uh, people are just more than happy to be themselves. You know, you see people writing albums about frogs and, uh, about yeah. whatever it is you know 16th century swiss mercenaries it's like cool do it more of it i love it so well, drums in the deep wood your second album that you did under ella Villon, what i thought was really cool whoever you commissioned as the artist the the album art was really cool it reminds me of something you would see i know this is a terrible example but i'm from the 80s so this is just how i think something you would see on like a 1980s um, never ending story kind of film cool. meets some weird little elf in a Christmas shop somewhere in your grandmother's attic, maybe, I don't know. And just the weird mysterious little vibe that that album cover gave me instantly drew me in to say that looks like something you would find in some hidden forest somewhere. It, it's just weird, but I like it. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, th that's all definitely like the mystery and you know what could be lurking in those deep dark woods definitely what I'm going for there um, I love 80s like cheesy pulp fantasy not even pulp because they never really got popular but like uh, the dark crystal never ending story oh. willow stuff like that love it so um, I'm glad you had that connection uh, that one was drawn by uh, David Thierry he's like a French uh, he does a lot of metal album covers but he's big in into dungeon synth as well from what I can tell um yeah. really nice guy um and Fantastic. yeah that, yeah he's amazing um heavily inspired by john bauer who was like a late 1800s uh swedish painter and illustrator okay. he did a lot of folklore and i mm -hmm. think a lot of like our modern conception of what trolls you know are meant to look like came from him so uh okay. cool yeah. i didn't know that really cool artist uh you'll see his his art um thrown on a lot of dungeon synth album covers because mm -hmm. it's old enough to be uh what's the word common domain public domain um oh okay it's like fair game to you know slap a john bauer or like a theodore kittleson uh like painting on your cover and then put you know in uh like germanic font or black letter gothic font like you know dungeon synth guy on the front and you know there's your album cover right so a lot of people do that but i wanted to commission my own because i wanted one that nobody else had so i love it i thought it was really cool 
And the other one that really caught my attention um, was because I am a, people don't know this about me unless you know me, but I'm a Christmas junkie. I -hmm. love anything to do with Christmas. Anything from November 15th on, I'm listening. In fact, I've been listening to Christmas music already. Let me be transparent with you guys. I, I need to be honest with you. I'm just, I'm weird. So I love the mystery of the Christmas season and I love it all. I think it's beautiful. And Full Moon Over Yule Tidy, your most recent work. Oh, uh, that was really good. That was really wow. that's what really drew 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 me into you. I was like, oh, a Christmas album. This is awesome. It was so cool because you don't hear that kind of music played much anymore. You had that old historic um mystical approach to the Christmas songs that you don't hear much anymore. Now you hear more poppy Christmas music. And I, I really liked your approach to it. Thank you. I This one was a little bit uh, worrisome for me to release, right? Because a lot of the dungeon synth scene and, you know, I guess black metal in general can be very like, well, that's awfully comfy, you know, you, you that's not very true or caught, you know, whatever. Um, I was like, man, I hope I don't get raked over the coals for this. But I mean, honestly, didn't matter. I, the way I operate is that I'll have, like, I'll just be walking along one day, doing my thing, whatever that is. Um, and an album will just sort of materialize in my head as if it were like downloaded there. And I think, okay, yeah, I could make an album. This will be the aesthetic. Um, Mm -hmm. these will be the instruments that I used to like I don't know it just showed up in my head I was like man I should really okay I'm really into history fantasy culture you know international cultures I find to be fascinating and Christmas is something that fascinates me Mm -hmm. because you know yuletide right uh it's this ancient pagan holiday that had Christmas like when Christianity came to Europe there was sort of this recognition that, hey, like, this is about like the, you know, with the timing of the solstice, the sun is at its um, nadir, it's at its lowest point, right? You have the, the shortest day of the year, we'll have this great celebration of like light, and like, I guess, uh, rebirth of the world, sure, at, uh, at from, uh, you know, the, it's like the tides have turned at this one point, right? And so there's a big feast in the celebration of that. Uh, light at the darkest point, right? That's how I see it. And Christianity came and said, oh, well, actually that lines up pretty well with say the folklore of, or the, I guess the story, the the theology of what we're celebrating at Christmas. You know, it's this darkest point of humanity, you say, and a savior shows up, right? And it's the birth of the savior leading to eventual salvation is, I guess, theologically how you would uh, parse that out. And the fact that, you know, ancient peoples are not ancient, I guess this would have occurred later than that, but still, um, so long ago, people worked this out and had enough dialogue and communication between the two to say, okay, and sure, maybe there were, there were some violence involved and, you know, all sorts of uh, craziness occurred, but over, you know, the next 2000 years, we have really what is like the lore of Christmas to me seems very split between like the old, you know, the old world, uh, you know, pagan religion and, uh, and Christianity in a sort of seamless way. And I just find that to be utterly fascinating. It, it applies to a lot of other holidays too. I think Easter is a fantastic example, but um, you know, I just, it hit me one day. I was like, man, you could really lean into like a combination of, like medieval Christmas songs from a perspective that blends the these two cultures because that's what the holiday is and so I sought out to find all the oldest Christmas songs I could whether they were associated with Christmas formally or like Yuletide and so um, due to the fact that I've been able to make so many really cool friends across the world through Dungeon Synth you know I just Mm -hmm. have like essentially pen pals from all over the world who I can talk to and um, a lot of those folks are from different countries that have different, I guess, Christmas uh, traditions. And so, you know, pulled yeah. in like a, a Finnish song and uh, pulled in some French songs, stuff like that, but really wanted to get like a holistic analysis of that uh, winter festival type holiday. So 
there's a guy I follow who breaks down. He goes by inspiring philosophy on Instagram, but he's he's a philosophical mind, and he breaks down the pagan slash Christian religious holidays to see like where do the actual roots fall. You would be interested in seeing some of his his conversation on that. It's interesting. I'm, yeah, I'll definitely follow that because I find that to be fascinating. So that'll be great. And he, I will tell you ahead of time, he comes from a Christian perspective. So I will warn you just to, so you don't <laughs> be like, oh man, he's throwing me for it here. Oh, um, no warning needed. I mean, I, but that's I, the perspective I, I personally come from myself. So I, that's why I know the guy. And it's, he's interesting, very, very interesting historical approach to paganism, Christian uh, holidays. It's cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I, I really like religion and in, in general, I think, um, I don't know it to an extent, maybe in modern uh, society, it gets a bit of a bad rap, but the the lore and the wisdom and all of it is so interwoven in these ancient archetypal uh stories that are so you know deeply wrapped up with meaning and i don't know there's really amazing stuff there and uh I, that is one thing about the metal scene that really irks me sometimes is there's a lot of well, there's a lot of anti-religious sentiment and I, I mean, I, that that's a good way to drive me away from a project pretty quickly um well yeah and I don't think, I think it should be open just like the musical thing we've talked about. I think yeah. black metal yeah. should be, we should be free to talk about what we believe in love. Like people should be free to do that. And for this project for black forge, I started this cause I love it. I don't make a penny doing this. I, I did this because I was writing for HM magazine, which is formerly a what you would call christian metal magazine which is no longer it just does metal they just do but i grew up reading hm and i love music i don't care i don't care if you're christian or not i don't care that's not my focus my focus is what kind of music are you making are you making music that elevates the human spirit or are you making music that degrades the human spirit and a lot of black metal degrades but i think i have discovered in my because i search way too much i'm one of these junkies who just yeah. I'm a true, I guess you could say I am a true journalist at heart, even though I'm I'm not a paid journalist. I explore. I love digging in and finding out about who people are. And I have found, I would argue, and I, this is my opinion, but I would argue 80% of the black metal slash synth, whatever you want to call it, community has very little anti-religious sentiment. Most of the community are, they're interested in what you do. They like fantasy. They like talking about nature. They like talking. They may be agnostic or atheist or whatever their worldview is. I don't know. But they're not really hate-filled human beings who want to go, you know, cuss out the, the local church. The, the, these are people who are just wanting to make good music that they are inspired by. And mythology is something everyone can relate to, whether you come from a religious background whether you don't, we all find that's what makes Lord of the Rings or even Harry Potter. I mean, anything that has mythology to it, that's what makes it so appealing to the human spirit is we are all drawn to wanting to tell a story that is larger than life. That's my view. I anecdotally would agree 100%. I've, in, I've interacted with a lot of people um, in you know a variety of music scenes and I, you just, you don't really, I don't know. I, I really haven't interacted with many people who I found to be hate filled or pulling down the human spirit, like you said. And um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it shows up more in uh, music that I guess is already quite popular, right? Like if you look at the, maybe the roots of black metal, but I don't care about that anyways. I'm looking, I like the, you know, I really like to find the underground stuff that you know, some guy who you could probably send a message on to on Instagram and like start having a conversation with, right? It's just very down to earth. It's like, hey, here's what I'm getting at. It's usually an uplifting thing. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm trying to do with Elvron 100% is make something positive and uplifting. And, um, you know, I write all this poetry to go along with it that I really try to drive the point home of, you know, just uplifting um, escapist fantasy music. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting because I, I mean, I was, um, I know we, our time's running out, Ooh. but um, what is interesting, we'll have to keep this conversation going at some point, maybe we do a part two in a few months. 
Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, but I, I find this music to be fascinating. And I honestly sometimes wish we could just redefine what black metal and its whole family means. Because most people look at it and they have a side eye because they don't, they have that historical church burning background, but they don't really understand what it's evolved into over the past three decades. So I think there's a lot of beauty to be found in the music that I, that I see. And there's so many beautiful artists that I've connected with that are in the scene that are just awesome people. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. So I've got, I can't tell who it is, but another interview coming up soon with uh, a group there. I don't think they're spiritual, but they have some really cool uh, approaches to their version of black metal and how they're using it to lift up the human spirit. So it's going to be interesting to see how that yeah, goes. Definitely. I'm definitely going to have to uh, keep my eyes peeled for that one. So anything you want to share with, with your audience here, anybody, anything coming up, any new music, anything? So uh, it says we have less than a minute left. So I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah. Working on a new Elevalon record. It's the most ambitious one to date, uh, really diving into the archetypes and trying to make something as good as I can. Um, trying to get, I've been writing more Bone Weaver, writing a bunch of like doom metal projects and all kinds of crazy stuff, but just trying to make sure I get it all released. Uh, hopefully the next Elevalon within the next year is the goal. We'll see. But uh, yeah, that's really it. 